So uh, now I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Faridi to come and present his uh, uh, presentation, Cannabis Use, Medication Adherence, and Symptom Intensity, Exploring the Complex Interplay. Dr. Faridi is a psychiatrist at the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University. Uh, he did his fellowship uh, at uh, our program uh, and worked on uh, the interplay between cannabis use and symptoms. And he is also the director of the uh, education program for medical students at the MOOC. So, Dr. Faridi. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you everyone. Hello, and hello to everyone on the web diffusion. So, uh, I'm very mindful of the fact that it's lunchtime, so I will keep this brief, I hope. I'm going to be speaking today about uh, some work I did during my fellowship and a little bit afterwards, looking at cannabis use, medication adherence, trying to come, find a way to understand kind of what's going on. I've been interested in this topic for quite some years, and my interest came from a number of different kind of factors in the literature that seem to be coming together uh, and pointing to the fact that I'm looking more into schizophrenia and other psychotic illnesses and uh, drug abuse, substance use in general, and cannabis especially, could be very uh, fruitful. Now, first of all, we have the observation. Time and time again, cannabis use is uh, very common in first episode psychosis, with uh, most studies reporting rates of between about 20 to 50 percent, let's say. We have the observation that cannabis use is a risk factor for psychosis with a, a very nice meta-analysis that was published in 2007 or 2008 in The Lancet showing there's really a two-fold increase of, of uh, you know, the risk for developing a, an incident psychotic disorder in young people who are using cannabis. We uh, know both from clinical experience and from laboratory studies done by D'Souza that, that cannabis use can increase uh, levels of psychotic symptomatology. We know that cannabis use impacts the outcome of the first episode of psychosis. And then finally, we have you know, the, the knowledge that dopamine, generally speaking, is implicated in substance Okay, thank you. Uh, the dopamine is implicated in substance use disorders and in specifically in mediating the craving for substances. So this raises the question of whether antipsychotics may have a role in treating substance use. Uh, a little bit more on, on the question of dopamine and drugs. Um, dopamine is a central player in drug reward mechanisms and drug conditioning. We know that D2 agonists can block the reinforcing effect of stimulants, specifically in, in animals. And there's been uh, a small literature, I'd say, that shows in case series and retrospective analyses and a few open label trials that suggest that, that atypical antipsychotics, uh, particularly, may be useful in the treatment of substance use disorders, both in people with a, a comorbid psychotic illness and also some, a few uh, reports in people without a comorbid uh, substance use disorder. Now, uh, you have to be cautious because uh, these are all open label type uh, studies and the randomized controlled trials have really not been as consistent with their findings. Uh, and then just a note, there's been one study that was published recently which actually showed that uh, clozapine users had uh, much lower rates of cannabis craving compared to uh, Risperdal users in a population of uh, people with comorbid uh, psychotic illness and, uh, and uh, cannabis use. So all of this uh, raised some questions that I tried to answer during my fellowship at the, the first episode program here at Douglas. Uh, first of all, how many PEP patients use cannabis and how many stop? Uh, are there any patient characteristics or uh, illness characteristics at baseline which can kind of tell us which cannabis users will cease to consume the drug over the course of a year? Does the outcome differ if a patient per, uh, stops using the drug compared to if they persist in using the drug? And finally, is medication adherence or the choice of medication used or the dose of medication, are any of these things uh, associated with the, the likelihood of stopping marijuana use? A brief slide about the methods. Uh, so this was a, a study based on existing data that we had uh, at PEP. And uh, one of the great things about, uh, about the PEP program is that every patient who comes into the program, as you've heard, I think, also signs a consent for uh, research data collection. And this data is all available in a database which is very rich and uh, uh, very, uh, you know, very interesting to study. 
So this was uh, based on 192 consecutive admissions to the PEP program, the first 192 patients. We uh, had sufficient baseline data on 186 of those people, and we had 75% of them, or 145 people, had sufficient data at 12 months of follow-up. So what I did is I, I used this data from the first 12 months of follow-up. I, uh, you know, these patients were all followed as per the usual PEP research protocol, which included PANS, BPRS, Calgary Depression Scale, et cetera. The uh, SCID was performed at baseline and at 12 months. And that's, uh, it's important to note that when I use the terms THC abuse or dependent, uh, dependence or THC use disorder, I'm really basing myself on the SCID diagnosis. Uh, as opposed to some measure of how much marijuana was actually consumed, or as opposed to, uh, you know, the DAST or some other some other instrument, where we're looking really looking at people here who met DSM-4 criteria for a substance or a cannabis use disorder. So what did I find? First of all, the question: How many use? Uh, we can see here that if we draw your attention to this line uh, about. Uh, Exactly half of the patients in this sample had a lifetime history of a cannabis use disorder, and one third of them were actively consuming and abusing or, or dependent on cannabis at the time of their entry into the program. Um, it was about half and half between those who had a THC abuse diagnosis versus a THC dependence diagnosis. And there was also a group of, uh, of about 6% who had polysubstance use diagnosis, and in each of those cases, cannabis was one of the uh, substances consumed. The next question was, how many stop? So what I found was of the 48 subjects for whom we had a full year of data uh, who were using marijuana at, actively at entry into the program, um, about 40% were able to stop their marijuana use over the course of that year. Uh, we've heard a lot about the treatment for uh, cannabis use in the first episode psychotic population and what is offered and what should be offered uh, from Dr. Dixon and, and from the, some of the commenters. So just to let you know, what we offer at PEP is uh, basically specialized early intervention for the, for the psychotic illness. It's not a specific cannabis or, marrow, or substance use module. There's no uh, like substance use group or anything that's, that people have. However, they do have case managers and psychiatrists who are uh, very preoccupied by the question of substance use and who are very, uh, I guess, comfortable in using a motivational approach and uh, as well as doing things like looking at other ways for, for clients to manage their stress uh, with the goal of helping them to reduce their substance use. So 40% 40, 40 were able to stop using the drug. The likelihood of their stopping the drug was predicted by the uh, severity of their drug addiction at baseline. So people with, not surprisingly, people with more severe drug abuse at baseline had a harder time uh, stopping the drug. However, people with more severe psychotic symptoms at baseline, that were, there was no association, nor was there association between any of the demographic characteristics such as uh, age, years of education, and so on, uh, SES as well, that did not uh, that did not help us tell who would be able to stop versus who did not. And the diagnosis of their psychotic illness, whether they had an affective illness or a non-affective illness, um, that did also did not influence their likelihood of stopping. Sorry, just bring my timer up. Okay. Then the next question was, is outcome and symptom levels better in the people who do succeed in stopping their drugs versus those who keep using it? What I found, surprisingly, was that it was not. They looked identical. Uh, so I'll just, I, I looked at this in a lot of different ways, but I'll just show you a couple of slides in the interest of time. So this is the PANS positive score over the course of the first 12 months of follow-up, which you see down here. And you can see in both groups, they, they did really well. Their PANS came down by 15 points or, or so in the first three months. Um, this is consistent with what we expect in, in follow-up for a first episode of psychosis. And uh, both groups, the, uh, the level stayed low, whether they stopped using their drug or not. If I look at it a different way and look at their, their time uh, to uh, remission, uh, again, over 12 months on the x-axis and the survival on the uh, y-axis time to remission, we can see that both groups did experience remission. Most of the cases remitted fairly early, and there was no difference between the groups on that, 
that factor as well. There was also no r difference on factors such as like likelihood of having a relapse in a year and uh, in any of the other PAN subscores, et cetera. But then I thought we should need to bring in the question of medication adherence into this because obviously medication adherence is the, you know, probably the biggest predictor of relapse, the biggest predictor of symptoms, et cetera. And here's where I had a, a surprising finding that I really wasn't expecting. At 12 months, the people who were stable users, in other words, the people who kept using their marijuana over the course of the 12 months, they were also the ones who kept using their drugs over the course of the 12 months. Um, and the other group, who had stopped their marijuana use, a large proportion of them, 40%, or sorry, 60%, had stopped using their, uh, their antipsychotic medication. Uh, so that was a statistically significant difference, and it raised the question, what is the impact now on the symptoms when you look, when you include the, the, the very different levels of, of uh, antipsychotic use in these two populations? So this is just, uh, Dr. Dixon showed this earlier, this is just what that looked like, you know, graphically over time. Um, they both started out, both groups started out with fairly high levels of medication ad adherence, and over time, uh, they both dropped. Uh, and then in the marijuana users, it seems that after about six months, they once again started to use, uh, started to, to take their antipsychotic medications, whereas the people who stopped marijuana use, they did not resume taking their medications. What does this mean for symptoms? So I like to look at data in this way sometimes, just look at all the data on a graph. So that's what we have here. These are all the subjects. Uh, the ones in blue are the ones who are smoking marijuana. The ones in red are the ones who stopped using their marijuana after a year. This is the PAN's total score. Uh, the dotted line here is the, uh, is the median for this sample. The solid line is uh, a score of about 58, which is equivalent to the CGI classification of mild illness. Uh, so just so we can kind of situate ourselves in terms of severity of, of uh, symptomatology. Above the line is mild or above. Below the line is a situation that's better than having mild symptoms. So we can see that the stable users are, all, are most, almost all clustered over here in the 100% uh, compliance category. This is 25, 50, 75, 100% compliance. You can see that most people either they take all their medications or they take none. And most of the blue dots, the stable marijuana users are over here, and a good lump number of them have a level of symptoms that are above the median or above the, uh, the cutoff for mild, mild illness. Whereas all of the people who stopped using marijuana and who persisted in taking their medications, all of them are below that cutoff. Contrast that with the, uh, the people who's, the, the red dots who stopped their medications, um, the red dots being the mer sorry, the red dots being people who also stopped their uh, marijuana and who stopped their medications as well, and many of them are, uh, are doing okay, but there are a few dots here and there who are having, experiencing more symptoms. So what that tells us is, well, we don't know what it tells us. It raises a lot of interesting questions. Uh, it raises the question of whether marijuana users, when they choose to um, continue using their marijuana, if they also reason that, okay, well, the doctor says this is good for my psychotic symptoms, which might be worsened by marijuana, so maybe I better uh, keep taking these medications. Uh, that would be uh, an, interesting, an interesting thing if that was uh, the thought process that's going on, and I'd certainly like to look into that more. So this was the second project uh, that I started during my, um, during my fellowship, and this, uh, this is a project that, that finished at a collection about a year ago, and uh, I've been in the data analysis step ever since. Uh, so the marijuana craving, uh, I was interested in looking at marijuana craving specifically. So up to now, I've been looking at a fairly, you know, um, gross measure, which is whether people have marijuana use and whether that marijuana and and that marijuana use being severe enough to qualify for a DSM diagnosis. So if we look at a different measure in terms of the craving of marijuana, we might be more able to pick up more, uh, more subtle effects. So we know, as I mentioned before, that drug craving is, uh, is dopamine mediated. That's simplification, but that's, dopamine certainly plays a role in the craving and the wanting of a drug. And we know that psychotic medications 
uh, act on dopamine. So it raises the question, again, do antipsychotic medications influence the levels of craving and, uh, the, and the responsiveness of craving? Uh, in other words, the responsiveness of, responsiveness of craving refers to the likelihood that a, that a person will be triggered by some sort of environmental cue to, to want or to crave a drug. So to study this, I, uh, I added a few, uh, you know, I recruited 30 subjects and we uh, administered something called a marijuana craving scale or a marijuana craving questionnaire. It's uh, about a 12 item questionnaire that looks at, you know, asks people how much they want to use a drug, if they are planning to use a drug imminently, if they expected they would feel a lot better if they were able to use the drug at this point. And the craving scale was administered uh, for these are 30 patients in the first six months of their follow-up at, uh, at uh, PEP. And the, the scale was administered repeatedly in monthly intervals, uh, so all within the early phase of their follow-up, let's say. And each time they got the scale under three conditions. So their first was just their baseline. They walked in to the clinic and they got the scale. And then they were exposed to a story. And the story was describing someone kind of imagining a nice day on the beach where they would have a really nice time, really relaxed day. Maybe they would smoke some marijuana and have a nice day. And then that was the mild cue. And then there was also a moderate cue, which is really a story that was really more based on, you know, someone who wants to get high and is going to have, you know, really make a night of it and, and smoke a lot of marijuana and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also a high cue condition in, with this scale, but I chose not to use that with this population because it really got into stuff. I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to get high and I'm just going to smoke up and smoke up. And I thought it was a bit too much for this patient population, so I did not use it. So that was, those are the methods of, of this study. So far we've done a preliminary analysis, and what we found is that the marijuana craving is indeed cued by these stories in this population, which is, which is important because it hadn't actually been validated for use in a, uh, in, in a you know, population with a comorbid psychotic illness. We also found that the levels of craving seem to be completely unrelated to degree of positive symptoms, degree of negative symptoms, degree of depressive or anxiety symptoms. Uh, we found that the craving intensity at assessment was strong at each assessment in time was strongly correlated to the baseline. That is, the people who were strong cravers of the drug, or whose craving was very much triggered by these stories, they remained that way throughout their throughout these three months of follow up. And finally, there was no difference in craving levels if people are taking their medications. Now, for this part, I kind of thought this would just be a naturalistic experiment. I knew that you know, a good number of patients quit their medications over the course. Um, and I hadn't done the analysis that showed that in the marijuana using group, not many of them stopped using their drugs. So there's actually very few people in the sample who just naturally stopped using their medications over the course of these three months. So that makes it a bit hard to uh, use this data to really answer the question I was, I was uh, aiming at, which is, are people more prone to having craving when they're not under the acute effects of the antipsychotics. However, I think there's a lot more uh, interesting data in here and I'm gonna to continue to, to work to develop that. So, oh yes, so my, I have to apologize. My slides are truncated. I don't have a conclusion or acknowledgements. So I'll start with the acknowledgements. Uh, so I have to thank uh, Aldini Rowe who collected all the, the data for the marijuana craving uh, part. I have to thank Gerald Jordan who performed the uh, analyses that I presented. And I also have to, um, to thank for the other part, everyone at PEP, uh, all the symptom evaluators, all the patients. And I also want to really uh, thank uh, Dr. Mala, Dr. Joubert, both of whom who were excellent mentors and uh, supervisors for this research. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kia. Is there any question in the audience? Yeah, Suzanne. So please, a few minutes and then everybody will go for lunch. <coughs> okay. People are excited. Yes. So who is that? Ah, okay. Thank you, Kia, for this uh, really interesting body of, of work. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more of the results. Um, several years ago, we took a group of patients from the, from the Douglas and we did a very detailed um, 
lifetime history of their cannabis use from beginning, we dated the onset of the prodrome and the onset of the psychosis. And one of the things that we remarked was that there were a number of schizophrenic patients who had used um, pre-morbidly, but who had spontaneously stopped use even before the onset of the prodrome that there was a different set of patients who started using the prodrome. Some of those quit before the psychosis and others who started after the psychosis. And looking at your, um, at your slide on the use, um, I noticed that you've got um, 104 any uh, substance use disorder lifetime, but only 70 current. And then for THC, there were 93 lifetime 62 current. That means that within your sample, um, a third of those with a lifetime uh, diagnosis of THC uh, had quit before they ever came to PEP. Yeah, right. So you've got a bunch of people in there who managed to quit. So that could be a very interesting cohort as, I mean, those are, that's a whole other set of desisters. You just didn't watch them desist, <laughs> yeah. if you know what I mean. So yeah. no, it's, it's I'd be really point. curious to see what happens if you put those in with your desisters. They yeah. may be quite different than those who start and never Yeah, no, that's quit. a good point. And again, just, it's nice because I know this data is being collected still. And now there's been 500 plus patients who have started at PEP. And so soon we'll have enough enough numbers where we can really start to divide things that way and look into these really kind of smaller groups of people. Uh, and yeah, I'm very curious to see what we find. The, the work that we did um, in the Envirogen project with the PET patients, we have done this lifetime, um, very detailed year by year substance use. Um, so we should get together and. Patients, because these are the first 200 patients to PEP. So. Yeah, so Envirogen was active in the first couple of years, so we've got 62 or some. Yeah. I think we are getting late. Mm -hmm. yeah.